say, I just want to bring, make you aware of one important change to your program. To pick up from the Arnold Finney this evening, you can always join at the um, Crystal Pickett and Glass Globe. It's not at 5.50, it's at 5.45. We need a little bit more time. So, so if you're joining us on the um, joining us uh, on the drinks reception, then you make sure that you're at the Arnold Finney at 5.45 and not 5.50. Josh, you Sorry? It's the arts um, theatre, which is across the way. So if you... Hi, <laughs> 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 <Hello>, Jake. <laughs> Sorry, the important change to the program is that you need to be outside the Arnold Feeney at 5.45, not at 5.50. So if you're going to join us for the drinks reception, which I hope you will, then uh, be outside the Arnold Feeney at 5.45. Okay, our last talk of the day is given by Alex Clark. Alex is no stranger to Bristol. He was one of the um, very first uh, PhD graduates of uh, a group that was known as the uh, CQB. Since that time, he's been away in Australia, um, working in the uh, University of Sydney, but recently has uh, come back as a Marie Curie Fellow, but is now at the Royal Society Fellow, uh, University Research Fellow. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. And is at Imperial University, and he's going to talk to us about molecular quantum photonics. Perfect. Thank you very much, Graham, for the introduction. So, very happy to be back in Bristol, and as everyone has said, such a wonderful day for a boat tour. So. Really looking forward to this. I'll try not to keep us too long and, and hopefully not miss the boat. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you about the work that I've done since moving to Imperial College and that's been working with molecules. I work in the Centre for Cold Matter, so generally we want to cool these molecules down. But I'm also going to tell you uh, a little bit of a flavour about what's happening within the Centre for Cold Matter, working on other types of molecules as well. So within the Centre for Coral Matter, we're working on all kinds of quantum science, which use molecules. And I thought, as probably no one else is going to discuss uh, quantum science with molecules, I'd better tell you about it and advertise our field and our uses. So one of the main things that's been going on at Imperial for a long time in the group of Ed Hines and Ben Sauer is trying to use diatomic molecules in order to measure the uh, electric dipole moment of the single electron. So you would have thought that actually an electron is a point particle, but the standard model and other models of particle physics would have you uh, see different. And in fact, if you can measure a, uh, an electric dipole moment above a particular level, uh, then it means you can violate the standard model or prove that the standard model is incorrect. Uh, currently, they use very, very fast molecules, but actually we're working to slow down and cool these molecules in order to get a much longer interaction in order to measure this electric dipole moment. Other things you might want to do with diatomic molecules is to place them in an array and because diatomic molecules have a permanent dipole moment and this can also be adjusted by exciting them to various different states, you can have interactions between molecules that are distant from one another, much different compared to atoms. You can also uh, explore what's called cold quantum chemistry, whereby if you cool things down, you can prepare molecules into very well-known states, and then you can see how those molecules interact dependent on the state that they're in. So this is another interesting route. You can, of course, use these molecules for quantum information processing. There's been many different proposals. Again, you make use of this for long-range dipolar interactions. But you can also store quantum information in the rotational, long-lived rotational states of molecules or clouds of molecules, which you can trap above electronic chips and things like this. Finally, what you can do with molecules is do quantum photonics, and clearly that's my expertise and the route that uh, I go down. Uh, all of this is uh, covered, or much of this is covered, in fact this is separate, but all, all of this is covered by a, a large consortium that we've uh, recently uh, entered into, which covers quantum science with ultra-cold molecules. That quantum science with ultra-cold molecules consortium consists of members from Durham University, it's led by Simon Cornish, who's based there. He does the association of uh, rubidium and cesium and other types of uh, uh, transition metal and other metal uh, atoms in order to make uh, weakly bound molecules. And then we have uh, some theory support from Dieter Jacks group uh, at Oxford, as well as all the people who are working on this at Imperial College. Uh, this is broken down into a number of areas. 
We're working on advanced sources of molecules, both the polyatomic molecules that I'm working with, but also cold and slow and trapped diatomic molecules. Uh, we're working on interfacing various molecules with photonic devices. This doesn't come out very well, but there's a better picture later on of this hybrid plasmonic device that we're using, as well as ring resonators and photonic crystal resonators and other things. We're working on trapping diatomic molecules above AC uh, electric field chips, such that you can, as I mentioned, hold them above and then manipulate the rotations of clouds of molecules above these chips. This is something that Ed Hines, who I work with, was an expert in for atoms and now is applying this to molecules. We want to place diatomic molecules into tweezer traps such that you can then have uh, diatomic molecules can be moved closer and further apart from one another inside these optical tweezers. And you can also manipulate the states inside these optical tweezers. Want to this is all getting harder and harder things to do, by the way. <laughs> the next hardest thing to do is to place all of these molecules into lattices. Uh, in first instance, a 1D lattice, but then 2D and eventually 3D lattices. And to make this a reality, the best way to do this is to take what's a quantum gas micros microscope for atoms, but build a quantum gas microscope that can manipulate molecules such that you can place them in a very well-ordered or structured array and uh, push them into, different, into and out of different states. Some recent results from, from this part that I wanted to tell you about, because it's exciting results from the Imperial College Group, all led by uh, Mike Tarbert, who's the group leader for the calcium fluoride experiments, is that recently they've managed to not only slow down, but also trap calcium fluoride molecules in a magneto-optical trap. So interestingly, they generate their calcium fluoride molecules inside a cold cell, so this is actually cooled to uh, about 7 Kelvin, and then so there's a buffer gas inside here of helium, which interacts with uh, calcium fluoride. The calcium fluoride is made by ablating calcium in the presence of sulfur hexafluoride, which makes some chemistry. I don't understand this bit. <laughs> some chemistry makes some calcium fluoride for you, which then collides with the uh, cold helium. This slows it down. But it's still traveling at about 100 meters per second through this, uh, uh, through this um, vacuum system, effectively. Uh, in order to slow it down, they send uh, light back. Actually, it's about 20 different laser frequencies. It's three lasers, which are all modulated to cover all the vibrational and rotational transitions in the molecule. Um, but by, uh, by, doing, by doing so, by sending light back, the molecules will scatter photons, and they will slow down effectively just by light pressure. You can then slow them down. The problem is, as, you, uh, as, you, as the molecules slow down, there's a Doppler shift in the energy levels of all of these transitions, so the molecules stop seeing the laser light that you're sending down the system. So in order to counter for that Doppler shift, you have to chirp the light as the molecules are slowed down. And if you chirp this, and chirp this, and chirp this in the right way, then you can find that as the molecules then enter the final science chamber, they can be slowed down all the way to uh, around uh, 15 meters per second, which is enough that then it still sounds really fast, right? <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, but then they're slow enough that they're within the capture velocity of a magneto-optical trap. So there's magnetic coils inside here and some counter-propagating orange beams which interact with some of the molecule transitions such that you push them back to the center of this magneto-optical trap and you can trap uh, calcium fluoride molecules. So recently, they managed to trap uh, uh, on the order of 20,000 molecules inside the magneto-optical trap. These were the initial results, and actually the temperature of this was limited to a, a few millikelvin. Sounds cold, not cold enough. <laughs> so in order to get these colder, actually you have to do a trick where you detune the light from the red side of a transition to the blue side of a transition, and you can cool these down all the way to 50 microkelvin. Uh, the way that you measure the temperature is that you uh, let go of the field, in, uh, the, the cloud, and you let it expand. And you can see this is really not expanding anymore. So you've reached what they call a sub-Doppler temperature. If you're interested, it's published in this uh, Nature Physics paper just last year. And they reached this 55 microkelvin level. Uh, now that they have these very cold molecules, they very, very recently, in fact, not published yet, uh, trap these in a, in a magnetic trap. So you switch off the light, and you can trap these in an AC magnetic trap. And then by sending in a, a, so this is a Ramsey experiment, but based on the ro uh, rotational, uh, between rotational levels in the molecule. So you're using microwave fields in order to, in order to, uh, in order to measure this Ram Ramsey spectrum. So you put it in a superposition of two rotational levels, allow it to process for some time, and then put it back out of the superposition and measure it. And here you're changing the frequency of the microwaves, and you can see these really nice 
quantum coherent control of these molecules. So I just wanted to point out these really nice results on the diatomic molecules before we dive into the quantum photonics and uh, mo uh, um, many, many atom molecules that I'm dealing with. Okay. So I generally deal with uh, molecules that have many more atoms, not just two, but around 50 or 60 atoms. Dimo these dye molecules, these are all organic molecules, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, have pretty nice properties that their emission spectra can cover a huge range, all the way from down at 400 nanometers with anthracene, <laughs> pushing through to the blue re region with tetracene, green pentacene, they get harder to say by the way, <laughs> dibens and anthrene, which is a DBAT for short, which covers the orange region of the spectrum. Terraline, which is close to red, 690-700 nanometers, and my favorite molecule, because it's the one I use, dibenzoterraline, or DBT. Uh, this emits around 780 nanometers. You can see that these uh, molecules, therefore, have emission spectra that overlap with many other different quantum systems that are available, many flavors, uh, ions, diamond uh, defects, and other uh, centers from, from the NV to silicon vacancy, through to alkali atoms, uh, quantum dots, and you know, perhaps in the future we can find something that does some nice microwave uh, transitions from these dye molecules such that we can interact with superconducting circuits. As I mentioned, I concentrate on this uh, molecule for the moment. So we embed the dibenzoterraline molecules inside anthracene crystals such that they're locked inside a, an organic matrix and we can then cool them down to cryogenic temperatures such that the phonons are freezed out and then we can interrogate these molecules. Actually, they also fluoresce at room temperature, so we can always do test measurements at room temperature and other temperatures as well. This is a typical uh, uh, fluorescence confocal map showing single islands, which are single DBT molecules. There's a ridge here, which is actually the edge of the crystal. Uh, the kind of goals of the many projects that we're working on are to build narrowband photon sources based on these molecules and enhance the collection of photons from, uh, from a molecule such that you can have an efficient photon source. Uh, you can turn around having an efficient photon source means that sending a photon towards a molecule also inter interacts efficiently with the molecule. You can build a sort of nonlinearity into the system in this way. Uh, also, these molecules have some long-lived quantum states. The uh, singlet transition only lives for around 4 nanoseconds, but the triplet level lives for a lot longer, around 40 microseconds. So there's the possibility to use this for uh, solid-state quantum memory. I'm going to concentrate on the photon source side of things today. So what makes a good photon source? We've heard quite a bit about using photon sources for various applications. I would say there's a few things that you want from your photon source. You want to press a button and you want your photon to come out. So you want to have good control over when your photon is going to be emitted. You also want that your photon uh, stream that's coming out only contains single photons. You don't want any of these multiple photons in the stream. I want to be able to build many of these photon sources that are um, identical to one another. I need to be able to make these identical to one another in some way. I also want that the photons that are emitted are coherent, that they are indistinguishable and that they can be interfered on a beam splitter and give perfect online or quantum interference. Uh, a few questions that I'd like to answer. First one, what's the probability that this kind of system, this molecule, this DBT molecule, can be prepared in its excited state? You might think this is very easy, but actually across different temperature ranges it's not so easy. Also, what's the probability that different photons will interfere quantum mechanically? This is an important uh, step to uh, building up some kind of photonic quantum technology based on single molecules. And what's the probability that the photon can be collected to a single useful op optical mode? You know, I want to know where my photon is such that I can use it. I have a high efficiency photon source. So the first one, the excited state. Uh, this is an example of uh, some uh, confocal scan of molecules. This is all at room temperature, in fact, in this case. So I'm characterizing a, a small part of this crystal. This is about 20 by 20 microns across, and you can see fluorescence from single emitters. Actually, some are brighter than others, mainly because they sit at different depths within the anthracene crystal. The crystal is about uh, two microns, three microns thick, but it's uh, millimeters across. This is about half a millimeter across in this direction. We can send in a pulse, uh, some pulse la a pulse laser to the system and measure how long it takes for a photon to be detected on a photon counter. This allows us to measure the excited state lifetime of the singlet transition. And we get a lifetime of around 3 nanoseconds for this particular molecule. There's a spread from maybe 3 nanoseconds to 5 or 6 nanoseconds, depending on, again, where the molecule sits, really, its photonic environment. 
Uh, we also see at room temperature, pretty nice anti-bunching. I'm glad this was already introduced, I don't have to explain what anti-bunching is. We see a nice anti-bunching dip at zero time delay, uh, where it's slightly limited by the, um, um, the finite timing resolution of our detectors, so it's 0.2 once you correct for this, but actually there's a signal to background here of 10 to 1 at room temperature, and this corresponds, uh, this measurement corresponds to a G2 of 0.02 after correction. Still well below 0.5 in all cases, so we have single molecules in our sample. This is what the spectrum of DBT looks like, uh, both at room temperature and at cryogenic temperature. Cryogenic are these very, very sharp spikes, but at room temperature there's a very large dephasing, around a, a dephasing rate of around 8.2 terahertz, and so this means you have an extremely broad spectrum. Each of these lines corresponds to a, a, a decay from the excited state to a vibrational level of the ground state. Now there's an identical manifold of vibrational levels in the excited state, but this is actually useful because you can excite your molecule to one of these vibrational, vibrational levels of the excited state, which will very quickly decay to the, uh, uh, the lowest all electronic excited state before decaying back to the ground state and giving you your photons that you're interested in. Now at room temperature, all of these vibrational levels in emission are all overlapped. So all of these vibrational levels are also overlapped in absorption. And they're overlapped with the zero phonon line absorption as well. Now at cold cryogenic temperatures, if you excite this system on its fully electronic uh, zero phonon line transition, then you can only ever achieve 0.5 population in the excited state, and that's because of stimulated emission. If you pump to one of these vibrational levels in the uh, excited state, you can achieve full population inversion, much like you would for a three-level system. But at room temperature, everything is overlapped, everything is dephased in this way. And so it's interesting to investigate how much uh, you can uh, push the excited state population up, even by detuning your laser across these vibrational transitions. Now we modeled this and also made some measurements of this, and we find at room temperature actually you can only achieve about 70% population inversion uh, at room temperature, even if you detune across these vibrational levels. And as you detune, the uh, uh, intensity with which you need to illuminate the system, the saturation intensity, also increases effectively exponentially. Um, so it's interesting to think about how you might improve this. Now I work in the center of a cold matter, so we like to cool things down. And uh, if you decrease the temperature of the system, then you, de uh, you decrease the dephasing rate. And here you can see you start to resolve actually the vibrational structure. And you can achieve a population uh, in the excited state very close to one, if you can get to around 0.7 or 0.1 terahertz dephasing rate. So we measured spectra of the molecule, of a molecule, a single molecule, as we uh, warmed up the system and found that at around liquid nitrogen temperature, we have a dephasing rate on the order of 0.7 terahertz. So we can expect around 93% population inversion. We performed uh, uh, saturation measurements, uh, both on resonance and on this vibrational line at 14.2 terahertz, and indeed achieved this uh, level of population inversion. So this is nice, you can cool the thing down, uh, you can therefore uh, invert the population and have an efficient excitation of your system. Now, that's useful. Okay, the photons are not coherent yet, but for many of these uh, imaging, si imaging systems that we've heard about, you don't need necessarily for, say, this um, subposonian light source doesn't necessarily have to be coherent. Okay, it does for some, but not for others. So this is useful for, this is a useful photon source for some, for some applications. Okay. So the second thing I wanted to, well, I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm just going to show you that these molecules, when you cool them down further, down to liquid helium temperatures, so uh, down to 4 Kelvin, this is a confocal scan at room temperature. There's many, many molecules. When I cool down to 4 Kelvin, I can pick out just a single molecule, and that's because each of their resonances is shifted. There's an inhomogeneous broadening of the uh, zero phonon line transition, depending on the electronic environment around the molecule. So I can pick out a single molecule. I can also measure the resonance of this, uh, of this singlet transition, this zero phonon line transition in these molecules. And I can do that for various powers. And by extrapolating that back down, I find that I uh, reach the Fourier limit. So the width of this line is only limited by the excited state lifetime of four nanoseconds. So this becomes a 40 megahertz wide transition. It's almost atomically narrow. It also overlaps with, uh, uh, it's interesting that these, you can find molecules at 780 nanometers, so this is actually overlapped with rubidium transitions, and this is a project that we're pursuing at the moment to uh, make uh, light from a molecule interact with uh, rubidium magneto-optical trap. 
You can then look at uh, anti-bunching measurements down at this 4 Kelvin level, and anti-bunching uh, measurements at 4 Kelvin look a little bit different. They don't have this exponential rise that you, that you see at room temperature due to dephasing. They have a slightly curved bottom, and actually all of the black lines in these plots are based on a solution of the optical block equations for two levels, and you can see a very good agreement. As you increase the intensity with which you illuminate your molecule, you can see a narrowing of the, of the uh, G2 function and also the onset of these oscillations. These are Rabi oscillations between the ground and excited state. So you're effectively monitoring the excited state population at, um, with, with, as a function of time. And as you illuminate the system more strongly, you see these Rabi oscillations in the population. If you change the temperature of the molecule uh, between 4 Kelvin and 10 Kelvin, uh, you can see that there's, a, uh, uh, there's effectively an increase in the dephasing that damps these Rabi oscillations, and you start to move more towards the G2 function that you expect for a room temperature system. So all of this can be modeled in this system and is presented in this paper. Okay, now I want to move on to what's the probability that the photon can be collected into a single optical mode. We have a number of experiments or systems that we're using in order to be able to couple the photons that are emitted by a molecule into a single optical mode. One of the first ones is clearly, and you know, I'm talking to the right people here, is to use nanophotonic devices or nanophotonic waveguides. So this waveguide here has a small hole drilled into the center of this nanowire waveguide where we're introducing molecules at the center of the uh, waveguide so they're at the maximum of the electric field to couple them. Another method that we're using to couple molecule, uh, molecule emission to a single mode is a fiber optic micro cavity. So here you have a hemispherical mirror opposite a flat mirror that's on the uh, facet of a fiber v group array. That builds a cavity. You can tune the cavity because each side of it sits on sheer piezos, so they can scan back and forth, they can scan the cavity length, and you can align the cavity using some nanomax type stages. Now you introduce the molecules into this system by sticking a crystal by van der Waals forces on the front mirror of this fiber v group array, such that a molecule sits at the center of the optical mode of the single mode fiber. Then you tune the cavity until your whole thing's on until your cavity length corresponds to n lambda of the emission wavelength of the molecule. And in that way, you couple the photons directly back out into this optical fiber. You can combine these two ideas, and you can take this kind of cavity coupling idea with uh, uh, integrated photonic devices and introduce molecules into what are slotted uh, nanobeam cavities, slotted photonic crystal cavities, or into ring resonator systems, such that you can enhance the emission both on this zero phonon line emission, you can enhance, but also the collection of photons from the, from the molecule. Finally, we also have a project, which is a collaboration with Rupert Alton uh, at Imperial College, to couple molecules to hybrid plasmonic waveguides. And this one's a bit more exotic, so I want to talk to you about some results from this, actually at room temperature. So these hybrid plasmonic waveguides are built by taking a substrate of silica or glass, putting some high index medium on top of that, it's titanium dioxide, and then adding a grating onto the surface of this, so you can couple light in and out of this titanium dioxide layer. And then you need something to guide the light. And what we do is we have a bow tie shape, or a kind of tapered shape of gold on the surface of the, uh, on the top surface of this device. When the, mode, when the gold is very far apart, the mode shares itself between the edges of the gold and the inside of the titanium dioxide layer. But when the gold is very close together, it mainly propagates on, uh, on the edges of the gold. The electric field is very high here, and the mode is much smaller. If we place a DBT molecule at the, in, in this very high electric field, in this very small mode, it couples very well to this propagating hybrid plasmonic mode. Then when you taper these back apart again, you can pull the photons, which are emitted by the molecule, into the titanium dioxide before measuring. So we uh, put crystals of, uh, of dbt doped anthracene on the surface of these devices, and then we put it inside our confocal microscope. We can either detect photons directly back from a molecule to two avalanche photodiodes to measure this anti-bunching, this uh, second order correlation function and measure how many photons we're generating into the microscope. But we also have two extra inputs to the confocal microscope to send light in and out of these gratings to measure whether light was coupled to the propagating waveguide mode. We can see anti-bunching, although this is not a particularly a good example of anti-bunching. This is the first case that we saw uh, when we looked through the confocal collection only. But we can also look through the um, uh, 
one of the output gratings and one of the confocal outputs. And we see a similar anti-bunching dip showing that we've coupled photons out through this wave mode. So actually, um, that device was quite long in this first instance, and we think there were quite a lot of losses from this, which reduced our, signal to back, uh, reduced our signal, so it was harder to measure this. So we moved to a device where we have a very small interaction region and look for molecules coupled to this device. We found a molecule that was quite close to the optimum position, not quite perfect, but close enough. And then we measured the second order correlation function from this again, a much, much better second order correlation function, which me was measured uh, down to around 0.25 in this case. And this is room temperature, so there's a lot of stray laser light in this case. We measure the confocal and grating collection and see a very similar anti-bunching dip, in fact, very, very similar, showing that photons have been coupled out through this local grating. We then wanted to, well, we checked the lifetime of this molecule in order that we know how many uh, photons should be generated by the system. And then we measure how many photons we get through the confocal collection and through the grating collection. By taking into account the efficiencies of collection in both directions, we can back propagate that we have around 12% of the emission from the molecule coupled into the wave right? plus or minus 2%. So this is a nice uh, level of coupling. How does it compare to the literature? Well, we have this 12% uh, level from this. Uh, there's been coupling to a, a capillary-based waveguide from the Sandogdar group at the uh, Max Planck uh, Institute in Erlangen. Uh, he's also coupled molecules to an integrated titanium dioxide <laughs> waveguide, which showed a 5% uh, coupling to one direction. And our collaborators in Lens, uh, who uh, work in the group of Costanza Toninelli, have showed a 20% coupling, uh, which is slightly higher than we've seen, but our molecule was not in an optimum position. We're also investigating these all dielectric waveguides, uh, which I want to just tell you what we're doing in order to improve the coupling above this 20% uh, level that's been seen by the Toninelli group. The first one is to place a hole in the center of our waveguide mode and then open up a, uh, in a polymer layer above uh, a trench such that we can deposit molecules inside here. Uh, you can't see this because the light's really bad. It's nice and sunny outside, so you can talk to me about it later or come and have a look at my poster, which is over there. <laughs> But we've also managed to develop a new way of uh, making crystals so that we can embed DBT molecules inside nanocrystals. So there's no uh, Fresnel reflections of the light on the way out from this, uh, this system. So we can now get extremely high uh, uh, count rates on our detector on the order of 4 million uh, counts at saturation, such that we can measure these really nice uh, second order correlation functions. This is completely uncorrected. It's a G2 of uh, 0.006. Um, so you can also think to couple molecules via a trench through the waveguide such that you have a, a gap in the middle of your waveguide. So these were all fabricated by my student Seb Boissier when he goes to York to work with Thomas Krauss to fabricate these devices. There's a trench through the middle and then we introduce some capillary through the middle of these devices such that we can introduce molecules in between this trench. This should get us well over 20% coupling into each direction and it's quite a lot more scalable than the Toninelli method. Uh, so we've introduced uh, uh, DBT dope PDCB and showed that we can get narrow lines inside this very low temperature melted material, which is a way forward for us in these devices. So just to conclude, these cold molecules can make excellent indistinguishable photon sources for quantum applications. Uh, in order, uh, by coupling them to integrated planar uh, photonic devices, as we know from other talks earlier on today from the silicon photonics platform and other things, Ours are in silicon nitride, but again, it's uh, very scalable in this way. We can combine this nanophotonic uh, devices to build interferometers in the future such that we can measure some of these nonlinear effects from these single molecules. And we're also working in the group on uh, using other longer lived excited states in order to store quantum information in the molecules. So I should thank the group. I work closely with Ed Hines on these uh, projects and my two postdocs, Sam and Kyle, uh, two PhD students, Sebastian and Ross, and I'm also, I have a PhD position available, uh, as everyone seems to, <laughs> uh, uh, which is funded by the Royal Society, and a postdoc position, which is uh, funded by our new uh, consortium, uh, European consortium, which was funded by Quantira recently. So please get in contact if you're interested in those. And thanks for listening.
So that's, uh, that's exactly uh, part of this Quantira consortium over the next three years is to develop actually larger molecules. So DBT is already pretty much at the limit of solubility in solvents and a lot of the chemistry that's done when they synthesize these molecules is done in solution. But we've got some clever chemists that we're collaborating with in this consortium who can get larger molecules, just break two of the bonds in the larger molecules so it becomes floppy enough that it dissolves and then only reconnect those bonds at the last step of the synthesis. So we should be able to synthesize larger molecules, that they've got even longer names. DBQT is one of them, it's got a Q in it. Uh, but we, we want there to be, well, the idea is that this model to be emission, uh, well, close to one micron. Uh, now, if you want to push further, you have to be careful that the quantum yield, so the, uh, the, f the probability of non radiative decay might increase. For our molecules, it's negligible. But as you decrease this gap, there's more likelihood of non radiative decay. So this we have to watch out for. But this is something that we're trying. Yeah, sure. I'll shout. Um, so the uh, molecules, uh, you can pick them out by spectrally uh, resolving them, right? Yep. So they're not all the same, even though yep. they're all the same molecule. Okay. And so you end up with uh, some kind of electronic environment. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that due to the molecule itself or the environment of the molecule? And also, do you get blinking? Uh, so with these DBT molecules, I didn't really mention it, didn't really have time, but there's a very minimal uh, inter-system crossing probability. Uh, around 10 to the minus 7, in fact. And so we see effectively, well, we don't see blinking particularly. Uh, now, the molecule environment that it sits in does cause an inhomogeneous shift, but the width of the inhomogeneous broadening is about 400 gigahertz. And we've recently shown in a nanophotonic device uh, where you can have two electrodes reasonably close to one another that for, an elect uh, for uh, adding a bias of around 50 or 60 volts, so an electric field of around uh, a few hundred kilovolts per centimeter, which is fine in this case, then we can achieve tuning over 400 gigahertz. So we can tune the entire inhomogeneous broadening in this way. So actually finding the molecule, it should be tunable to any other molecule in this way. Is it possible to increase the density of molecules in your sample? And given that, could you imagine coupling them together somehow uh, through the large moment? Yeah. Actually, that's a really, really interesting way to go. In 2002, uh, Sam, Professor Fahid Samogdar showed that having two molecules close to each other underneath a SNOM tip, so you could get some local excitation, and then tuning the molecule resonances so that they were close to one another, you could see a cooperative effect between the molecules, so there was actually resonance in between, and if you measured only that resonance, it was bunched, so you're generating pairs of photons. Now, nobody's since then seems to have investigated this too much further. But there's talk with the chemists now about uh, having an inert linker between two molecules such that you can have a fixed spacing between two molecules so you can have some cooperative effects between them. And this is really interesting. Uh, I'm going to see about him some done next week, uh, uh, Photonics Europe, and I hear he's got some new cavity results which might show something like this. Thanks. Time for one question. Are you interested in, uh, well, another aspect of uh, combining It, it is interesting, I think. You're right. Um, if you can have an extremely high collection efficiency from a molecule, you can have an extremely high collection efficiency from 10 molecules on your node. And uh, if you can do that, then you have a nice 10 photon fox state. I mean, you can start to build all kinds of technology. But the, uh, well, okay, so the, you know, the current coupling is on the order of 20% to the waveguide mode. With the fiber optic micro cavity, we expect 25 with the mirrors we have and 80 if we improve the mirrors. Um, how high can we go? Well, we need to cap nano cavities, and people have been doing this with quantum dots for many years, and have, you know, work, many people worked on this. So there's bound to be many challenges to do this. But the fact that our molecule emission can be compatible with standard photonic devices that can be made in a standard foundry would mean that hopefully, by functionalizing these very nice standard photonic foundry devices, we can achieve very high efficiency. Then move to multiple molecules for sure. Thank you, Alex. Let's thank Alex again. Thank you.